Our next speaker moving to J1JC, an experience report with Kirk Pepperdine. A big round of applause, please, for our next speaker. Hey. And in this session, we will explore the reality by looking experiences, uh, moving applications from CMS to G1G, G1GC uh, in real-time production um, environments. Thank you. All right. Howdy, everyone. Okay. So um, we have, what is it, 50 minutes? 40 minutes. Oh, God, I'm going to have to go fast. Okay, we have 40 minutes to talk about G1GC. <laughs> Sped up. Okay. Um, so um, last year, I had the distinction, uh, well, my, uh, uh, my boss Dave, is my business partner, actually, um, uh, put in an abstract. He says, come see this talk. Uh, Kirk's tuned around 3,000 JVMs. And I looked at him, I said, uh, why'd you say that? And he says, count them. And go, eh, it's going like, oh gosh, you're right. Um, uh, have the dubious distinction of tuning last year's but several thousand JVMs. Um, most of them moving from different type of collectors to uh, G1, GC. And they were, they were interested because, you know, how many people here are using JDK 9 or 10 in, in production environments? Nobody. How many people are using JDK 8? That's just about everybody. Seven, a few seven, sixes. Why not? We'll go down the list here. Five, don't be embarrassed. <laughs> one, four, two. One, 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 nine, or one, one, nineteen. Anybody? Nobody. Excellent. Okay, that's the first time that's happened in a while. Okay. Yeah, so, so everybody was like, it was basically a lot of people here on eight. Um, you're using the default collectors that you're uh, normally used to using, which is the uh, parallel collector, if you haven't specified. And maybe you've, you, you've gone on and you've, you, you're using the mostly concurrent Mark Sleep collector, CMS. Is anyone here actually using G1? One, two, three, yeah, okay. Yeah, there's spatterings of people here that have been brave enough to say, yeah, let's check this out. And, and that's really what the clients are looking at. They're looking at, in JDK 9, uh, G1GC becomes a default collector, and they're fig just trying to figure out, okay, well, you know, everything works in eight, so let's mess it up by seeing if what G1GC is going to do to us. Um, and, and so they're trying G1GC, and it's like, okay, well, that's one thing. I guess the other thing is like, why do we need a new collector? You know, weren't all of the collectors that we have uh, good enough? And the answer was, yeah, it was, but they simply didn't scale. And the G1 GC is designed to scale. And there's some other issues too, like, um, uh, you know, uh, tuning CMS. Has anyone tried to tune CMS? It's fun, right? Yeah, there's a couple here, not too many, but you know, there's all these flags you have to use to set things like, you know, like a T lab refresh size or something like that, right? It's like, you know, so the next question is okay, what the hell is a T lab? and why do I care about its refresh size and all this other stuff. So there's a lot of these really strange flags that you have to set to tune it, right? So, so the goal of, the, of, of, of G1 is to write a collector that scales as we go to larger and larger heaps. Um, you know, and I would say that's anything over about 16 gigabytes or so. And, um, and not only scale to larger and larger heaps, um, but actually be much easier to tune. Therefore, the way you tune G1GC is you set the max heap size, and if you're too lazy to do that, no worries. Um, the default value is one quarter physical RAM. That's the standard default. And you can set this magical thing called a pause time goal uh, to 200 milliseconds is being the default value. So if you feel the need to change to another value, then, you know, have fun. You can change that if you like. And really, that's all there is to it. That's how you tune uh, the G1 uh, garbage collector. <laughs> right, okay, so any questions? 
Oh, I guess we didn't use the 40 minutes. Right. <laughs> maybe we'll talk about something else then. Right. Um, maybe we'll talk about, you know, that was the ideal, that was the dream, uh, but the reality is somewhat different. And uh, really, the, the reality is such that, uh, that if you actually have to start tuning the G1GC, it gets very, very complex very, very quickly uh, because uh, there's just, again, a lot of moving parts. And, you know, when you see a problem, you try to fix that particular problem. What we find is that you immediately run into another problem. And that other problem might actually be worse than the initial problem that you're running into. And, and so, really, it's, it's this game of trying to find these balance between all of these competing concerns in the collector to try to get uh, good performance out of it, right? So, you know, what are we battling here? Well, we're battling long pause times. Who likes long pause times? Nobody, right? Or at least if you're still listening. Oh, so somebody over there really likes the long pause times. Awesome. Okay, cool. Um, and, you know, and so what do long pause times do? Well, everyone, you know, who believes that, you know, the garbage collection slows down your application, makes it run slower? Yeah, there's a few here. That's a misnomer. That's not actually the truth. Um, if you look back to the first, very first garbage collector, does anybody know when the first garbage collector was written? Shout it out. Don't be shy. Okay, be shy, I'll tell you. Uh, 1960. If we had more than 40 minutes, I'd go let, let this go drag out longer. 1960 is when the first garbage collector ran. It had an overhead of 40%. And you might go like, what? Why the heck would they use something that has an overhead of 40%? Um, and the answer is, um, the actual application throughput was higher with the garbage collector in the Lisp engine. It was Lisp that, where the first garbage collector showed up. Then, um, then, if they didn't use a garbage collector, and secondly, it made the programming a ton easier. People didn't have to worry about object lifecycle because you had this all-seeing, all-knowing thing that understood that, hey, this thing is no longer in use, I can just garbage collect it and get it out of there, right? So fast forward, um, a well-tuned Java application should have a GC overhead of about eh, one, one percent, ideally, maybe it gets to two percent or three percent or something like that, but certainly far less than five percent. So we've gone a long way in improving the collector, right? So what's the issue? Well, the issue is we get these random long pauses that can last, you know, 10 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, uh, 30 seconds, 7, 10, 15 minutes, or something like that. And it doesn't really do wonders for your tail latencies, right, for your response times, does it? So really what, we're, what, what the garbage collector is doing is it's allowing your application to have higher throughput, but what it's going to do is it's going to shoot down randomly a number of your transactions for some period of time while it cleans up after, you know, cleans up the mess that you guys made when you were uh, running your application. And um, so, you know, it's really this, a fallacy to say that garbage collection slows down your application. The reality is a lot more complicated. The reality is that there's always a balance between allocators, mutators, and garbage collection. And there's a certain amount of work that needs to be done. And you can give all the work to one of these three things, or you can divide the work up between these three activities. And a well-written garbage collector is going to balance the work between these three things so that your mutator threads, or application threads, are going to run really fast. Um, but every once in a while, they're just going to come to a complete halt, grinding halt, and of course, that's going to blow out your tail latencies, and it's going to clean up the world, and then it's going to let you go really fast again. Okay? So the good collectors will have some nice balance be between these, and all of the collectors have trade-offs. They've made trade-offs to say that, well, okay, we're not going to affect mutator rate, but that means the garbage collector is going to do a lot of extra work. When the garbage collector does more work, then, of course, we have long pause times. Um, if we give the work to the mutator threads, then of course we're putting load on the mutator threads, which means that our application throughput is going to suffer. So we need to find some balance there. Okay. Um, so 
after all that, we get into the marketing slide, um, which is this stuff here. Um, so I founded a company called J Clarity. We build a performance diagnostic engine, and we managed to do a lot of memory analysis and, and GC tuning and things like that. So we have uh, some tooling for that also. But primarily, we're interested in our diagnostic engine because it is um, a combination of machine learning and some interesting models uh, to help us diagnose performance problems while they're occurring in your production environment. Um, and along with Heinz Kibbutz and John Costaris, uh, we co-founded JCrete, which we call the hottest unconference on the planet. And Heinz is sitting in front here, not paying attention, uh, typing on his, uh, his uh, talk. When's your talk? Oh, you don't even know. Okay. <laughs> so I can't even promote his talk for him because he doesn't know. Um, right. So we've basically gone at talked about that. So what are the things that we need to know about in order to tune the G1GC? Well, here's the list of things. You know, we have this thing called Java Heap. Um, it's going to be subdivided into regions. Um, the, the algorithmic part of it is our, our workhorse mark sweep uh, tracing algorithm. Um, and of course, this is going to work in a tenured region, sorry, in, our, in a young generational region or a nursery where things are being created. And we're not going to use a mark sweep and tenured with the G1. We're just going to have a mark in, in our tenured space. Of course, the tenured space is where long-lived objects uh, end up. And then we're going to have these things called mixed collections. And it's the mixed collections that are actually going to clean out both the young generation space and the tenured space. So we'll look at that in a bit. We have other supporting data structures, which I'll talk about as we get into it. One is collection sets and these things called remembered sets. Okay. So um, everything works as you'd expect, as it did in the past. You start up with the minus MX value, which is the max heap size. And when I set MX, that's the amount of uh, Java heap that will be allocated. Um, right. It goes through a little bit of a process, but essentially you can think of it, it's just allocated in one contiguous chunk. We're going to divide it up into approximately 2,048 regions. Uh, we'll do some calculation here to decide how many regions, because the regions are all going to be single size, but they're going to be one of 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, or 64, sorry, not 64, but 32 megs in size. I think for one version they allowed for 64 meg uh, regions. Um, anyway, so there's a calculation. Here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of these regions, I'm going to put it into a free region list. Here's my animation. It took me a long time. Hopefully you like it. Okay, so here's my free region list. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to allocate so many of these regions uh, for the nursery. And then your application threads are going to start running. As soon as they go to perform an allocation, they're going to pick a region from the free region list. Um, and they'll mark it as Eden. And then they will allocate into that space. And so all the threads will allocate into that space until we've completely filled it. We go back to the free list, get another region, continue ad nauseum until we've consumed all the regions that the JVM has allowed us to consume for, uh, for um, our, our nursery. Okay. After that, we're going to get an allocation failure or something akin to an allocation failure. And that's going to trigger a young generational collection. In the young generational collection, we're going to take all of the regions, put them into this thing called a collection set, or a C set. Yeah? And then we're going to do a mark and sweep on uh, these uh, regions, right? So that's a mix of parallel and serial phases. So we're going to place all regions into C set, calculate a root set, root set for the C set. I'll look at that in a minute. If you don't know what that is, don't worry. Mark all of the live data in the C set. And then we're going to evacuate these regions into new regions called a two space. And they're going to take all of these empty regions and we're going to put them back on the free list. So this is known as an evacuating collection. So it's not really phased like this, um, but you can think of it this way. Now, last, we have this 
uh, ergonomics engine running inside Hotspot. And what it's going to do is recalculate the number of regions uh, that you can use for Eden. So this is going to try to shrink it in order to try to control the young generational pause time. But you don't want it to get too small because if you get too small, that means that data will be moved up into tenured space sooner than it should. And if data is moved up into tenured space sooner than it should, um, then that's going to cause all kinds of other havoc, uh, all kinds of other problems, right, that we don't want to deal with. So it's going to try to make it small. Sometimes it makes it too small. And what we want to do is we want to try to say, okay, don't do that. Make, you don't make it any smaller than this. By default, the value is 5% of total heap. And there's been some occasions where we've made that as much as 25%, just to slow down the rate of collections. OK. Um, yeah, so in terms of the resizing, you have a couple of parameters here, right? So, so much for this. We don't need these esoteric parameters. We actually need more of them. Yay. OK. And you can see they end up in the survivor regions. OK. So what does it all really look like in real life? Um, ooh, there's no yellow. Dude, there's no yellow. There's no yellow, dude. This, this is going to end up not good. OK. Um, the white is supposed to be yellow, but it's not. It's white. So pretend it's yellow for the moment. And, uh, and you can see what happens is that um, we have a whole bunch of these green things, which are Eden regions, and we have the yellow place, which is the two space, okay? And um, this is actually how it's really laid out. So the, so the slides I'm going to show you here, the pic pictures I'm going to show, are things that are drawn from data that we've derived from live production systems. Um, so unlike any other article or presentation you'll see on G1, this is the truth. All the other ones are lying to you, okay? They're lying to you to make an interesting point. I'll make that point later but I'll use real data to make the same point, okay? Um, awesome. Now, so what happens is that we fill, we evacuate, we fill, we evacuate, we fill, we evacuate, right? Um, and the C set in this case is going to be the yellow regions plus the green regions. And eventually, there's just gonna be data there that's just gonna survive for a long time. And what we wanna do in that case is we want to pump that up into another space called tenured. So Eden is from high RAM down. Tenured is from low RAM up. And they're going to sandwich each other in this case. OK? That's where everything gets. OK. Now, um, so if we do a young generational collection in this case, we go through all the steps. Mix the parallel serial phases. Place all young regions in a CSET. Uh, so that's the two space and, you know, the yellow and, gr and green bits. Um, calculate the root set for the C set. And when you get to that, it's like, okay, now we have a time complexity issue, right? So the question is, what is a root object, right? A GC root. This is an object that is, this is, this is an object that by definition is live. It's where we start the mark from, right? Remark is a tracing algorithm. We have to start from some place, and we trace the pointers, and everything we can reach is live. So the next question is, okay, so where are all the GC roots? Where do they live? Well, obviously, they live in tenured space, because I could have pointers from tenured into young gen. So I need to manage that. They come from metaspace. I'm not going to talk about metaspace here, but um, you know, it's another space that we have to consider. Uh, you know, comes from compressed class space. Comes from the JNI, right? If you have objects allocated from the JNI region, um, then of course that's another set of points. So we have to scan for those from stack frames. So if we have placed, placed data on the stack, parameter passing, allocation on the stack, things like that, right? Those are pointing possibly into young gen. Um, code cache, that's compiled code. Method cache, uncompiled code. Um, CPU registers, so there's some uh, optimizations that will just hoist the pointer values up into the registers and leave them there. So we need to go through the registers and find the GC roots, right? Um, so you can see that 
There's a whole pile of places where we need to go to find these things. All of this is parallelized, but I, it's only parallelized at a, on a component base, basis, which means that, you know, code cache, single thread goes through there. Uh, Metaspace, single thread goes through there. Well, not quite the truth, but effectively, right? So I have an issue here, right? How long does it scan for roots? Well, generally, it's linear to the size of, or to the amount of data that you have in tenured space. Well, actually, the size of tenured space. And that's bad. That's the, that's the scalability breaker right there. So we need something to help mitigate that problem or, or, or solve that problem. And, and you know, um, what we're going to do here is introduce remembered sets. And what remembered sets are is that it's a little, on each young generational region, there's going to be an extra data structure tag there. And what that extra data structure is going to do, it's going to track incoming pointers coming from, uh, from tenure space. Okay? Now, that means we've just given work to the mutators. Because the mutators now have to, every time they point to something in young gen, they have to record that information to the remember set. Now these things, these data structures are exceptionally complex and they're, they have a time complexity to update. So we don't actually have the mutator threads doing this work. What we do is we have our set refinement threads working in the background that are going to do this. So the mutator threads will queue the data and then these R set refinement threads will start working at updating the remembered sets, the R sets, okay? They're gonna use a zonal queue, and as the queue gets, uh, as the queue fills up, then you can see that different actions are gonna be taken in order to try to keep this um, uh, queue as empty as possible. Now here's one place where the pause time goal is used. Um, the number of R sets, uh, number of elements in, the, in this queue, um, the time for them to be processed cannot be greater than 10% of the pause time goal, right? Um, so where does this come from? Well, um, if there's stuff in this queue, when the garbage collector is called, the garbage collector is responsible for draining it. So it's gonna drain this queue. And we don't want it to spend more than 10% of the pause time goal in this particular task. Okay, now you might say, why not just set the pause time goal to zero, right? Because that sounds like a real clever thing to do, yeah? Again, when you do something like that, what we find is that this is a pay me now or pay me later with tons of interest collector. If you do not give it enough resources or enough time to work to get the job done properly, it'll come back to bite you in the future, and when it comes back to bite you in the future, it's really going to hurt, okay? So you don't want to set a pause time goal. As a matter of fact, what we've been finding is that the larger the pause time goal you give this thing, the shorter the pause times will be. Okay? So it's not uncommon for us to give a pause time goal of um, like a, a full second. And in that case, we often see that uh, pause times will run, you know, under 100 milliseconds just about all the time. And you won't get these like pause times that all of a sudden just shoot up because eventually there's work that this thing had to do that you've been telling it to avoid doing by setting an aggressive pause time goal. And uh, when that happens, then uh, it just suddenly says, okay, now I just got, I got to get this done. So I don't care what else is happening. We're stopped. I'm doing this. Now collecting tenured is a different story. Right? So when we collect tenure, so when tenure actually reaches this magical number of 45%, um, I think at 10 it's actually adaptable, so it's not always 45%. Um, wow, that's fast. Um, the, um, then we're going to start a uh, mark cycle here. And you can see there's some, uh, this is mostly concurrent. In other words, the green phases are concurrent, the red phases are stop the world. And when we build a CSET with this data, what we're actually gonna do is we're gonna calculate the liveliness. So here's all our tenured regions, 
and that's of the approximate liveliness in each region. So the mark is just going to say, how full is each region in tenured? We can take that, sort it. The two on the left, they're free, so they go back on the free list. The guys on the right are very expensive to collect, so let's ignore them for now, and we'll just collect this bunch in the middle. So I'm going to have up to eight mixed collections here um, that can actually now clear out all of these tenured regions. And again, we're going to evacuate these regions. So what happens is um, these regions will be included in the next young generational collection, and that's called a mixed collection because it has young generational and tenured regions. Um, one last point. What happens if we allocate larger than half the size of a region? We get a humongous allocation, right? And that's what all the red bits are. And this is where start, the visualization starts getting interesting, because now you can start uh, looking at what's actually happening in the heap, because you see the two guys at the top? That's more than likely cash. All the stuff down here in the bottom that's dipping into the reserve space, these are more than likely JSON marshalling. Right? These are JSON buffers uh, for inter-process communication. And um, you know, if you get too much of this happening and you use up all the space where you don't have a contiguous space to allocate a humongous a a object, what's going to happen is that you're going to end up with a very painful full GC. It's a complete full stop the world collection. It's parallelized in Java 10. I don't care. You know, they can paralyze the hell out of this thing. It's still going to be a very painful event with a large heap. You know, paralyzing sounds nice, but the reality of the situation is you just don't want to get there. And that's why the G1 tends to try to keep this reserve space in the middle there, uh, so that if you have one of these hum humongous allocations occur and you can't find a space in tenured, then we'll dip into reserve uh, to, try to, to try to satisfy the application. And that can work very well until you get into situations like this. So the light blue, dark blue are tenured regions. And you can see the tenured regions have almost all, almost all completely, they just squished out the young generational region. They forced the young generational region. Oh, we got some yellow there. So that's kind of cool. So you can sort of see the yellow, whitey, boxy things. That's the survivor space. And this is where you get this intermixing meaning any region can be used for anything at any time. Um, and you can see in this case here, we just simply don't have enough memory for whatever this event was. Um, although it looks like a mixed collection should be very successful in getting rid of all this stuff. Okay, um, I don't know if we're gonna have enough time, but normally what I wanna do is look at a GC log. There's some flags for getting a GC log. If you wanna know what the collector is doing, you need to collect the GC logs and figure out what's going on from there as to ask us what, why it's looking so long. So I'm going to just try to very quickly go through some tooling here to help you. Uh, this is Sensum, my GC log analysis tooling. Okay, so I have a GC log here. Um, and um, so there's some things here that are, okay, where's the mouse? Okay, some things that are difficult to see. If they're difficult to see, then what we do is we put an analytic in here. So for instance, this is high kernel times. Um, in this case, what we're seeing is that garbage collection threads are collecting a large amount of kernel. And, you know, the, the, the obvious question is like, why are they collecting kernel? How much kernel should they be collecting? The answer is zero. They should not be collecting any kernel time. Um, if they are collecting kernel time, you've got some problems in how your system is configured. Right? And this is an equal opportunity performance killer. So whatever is killing the performance of the garbage collector here, is also killing the performance of your application. It's just we have the data here to do the analysis. You don't. So I can just look at this data and I can just project how the application is, you know, what the application environment, the runtime environment looks like uh, from this. Um, and sometimes the environments are awful, especially if you get into poor virtualized uh, environment decisions. Um, I have a customer right now I'm working with. They have 15 JVMs running on a big box. The box is big enough. I asked them how many network cards they have. They said two. So, but they're the latest, greatest, brand new, fastest on the planet. And I said, you'd be better off with like half a dozen cheap, bad network cards than two really fast, good ones. 
right? And there's a whole bunch of queuing theory to back that whole thing up. Uh, but, you know, they were collecting a lot of kernel time, and this is a problem in their environment this is from the network cards. But anyways, you can see this, this chart here is giving me occupancy after the collection. So I can see what the live data set size is here. It's approximately six megabytes. Um, I can see that the heap is stable. I have this one pull GC event all the way up over here, which is an issue which we had to track down um, for some reason. That, that happened, it shouldn't happen. And you know, I can look at, um, I'll just look at a few other things um, here. Uh, safe pointing, uh, okay, pause time. Oh. Pause time characteristics, you can see I have two really bad pause time uh, problems here. So I wanna go and look at that, uh, that section and see whether there's something I can do to try to mitigate that. Now it might be a case I have to tune the application. It might be a case that I can tune the garbage collector. So that's all, that's all part of the decision making. Um, there's some other things in here that are quite common. These are all the parallel phases. And if I look at parallel phase percent, um, you can see this should be banded. Uh, object copy cost should dominate this picture. They don't. They're intermixed with this other thing called update remembered set. So here's a case where I might actually go in and tune the remembered set uh, behavior and I try to get to make this better. When we get into uh, other phases, you can see these yellow or greenish thing there, whatever color that is. Um, that's reference processing. By default, reference processing is not parallelized. It just turning it on can sometimes put that uh, green layer all the way down in, into the noise floor. So that should be like basically one fat, flat line. How much? Three minutes. Okay, cool. So you can see with using tools like this, we can see very specific problems with memory issues with our application. If we look at allocation rates um, here, I can see that this uh, uh, application during busy days times is um, relatively okay in terms of memory efficiency. Um, um, I can, I can look and see if there's any memory problems in terms of like, do I have a memory leak in the application? Do that type of diagnosis. I look at GC frequencies. Um, and you know, do we need to look at how to resize uh, specific pools? So there's a lot of data in here that we can actually uh, look at to help us understand what's going on um, actually in our environment. So we can look at, uh, in this case, uh, promotion, motion through the two space. Um, and in this case, the, uh, I would say it looks like the premature promotion rate is about uh, 33%, which is high. Um, so that's an issue also. So there's a number of issues here that we can highlight in this whole, um, uh, by using this tooling. And that helps us to make decisions. You know? So understanding how it works, having some data that you can fit in there, develop a mental model in terms of a cost model. And if you place all of these things together, then um, as you can see, you can start understanding what your collector is doing, and then you can start making some intelligent decisions as to how to tune it, right? Um, and you know, generally what I do with, in this case is that we're just gonna get rid of all of the flags, every flag that everybody has configured, right? Because the most common answer I have to why is this flag set is because, well, it's because it was set by someone else, we don't know why anymore. That person is not, no longer here. And maybe that person had a good reason for setting it, maybe not. But we'll just start from scratch with no flags and then just gradually add the flags that we need that are making a positive effect. We use the tooling to help us understand if we're getting the desired effect or not, as well as the, application, the effect on application performance. Okay, so, um, oops, don't know where that is. I don't think I have time to go through this slide, unfortunately. Um, the gist of it is that um, everybody believes that bigger heaps gives longer pause times. Um, this chart here, if you go through the mathematical analysis of it, says that um, bigger heaps do not give longer pause times. It's the volume of reachable data, the live data set size that determines the pause time. If you're tuned well with G1, your pause time should be constant. Or pretty much constant. You should see a band of constant times, okay? And that's exactly what this chart is saying. If my heap, heap is stable, then the variation in pause time is going to be due to momentary um, variations in how much heap I happen to be using. 
Okay. Um, whoops. Forgot to change that. I just from Wednesday. Um, you just drove down from Sophia. Anyways, um, if you want to learn more, you can join our uh, Friends of J Clarity mailing list. We talk about garbage collection. Um, Heinz has some channels on his Java Specialist channel that he'll uh, try to sell you on, um, which I recommend uh, joining. There's some really interesting stuff that happens there. Um, and uh, just uh, go like Vox to Athens instead of this thing and send some email and we'll get you some free licensing to some of our tooling. Just, you know, contact us. If you want to, you know, Friends of J Clarity, we have just about every performance expert up, uh, in the Java space is, is there. So it's a good place, a good resource for getting information sometimes. And that's pretty much all I have to say. Well, actually, that's, I have more to say. I don't have any more time. So thank you. Thank you on that. So you will get time. I mean, you guys also have the opportunity to network with all the speakers uh, during coffee and lunch break. So please do so. Mm. Uh, moving on to questions. Oh, we have, do we have time for questions? Then? We do. We have 10 minutes for oh, questions. Oh, OK. Guys. Sorry, I thought that was. There's I a hand up here. No time for questions. OK, yes, please. I'm curious on what kind of companies, what kind of applications, and in what phase of their life cycle you're usually called to optimize the, the garbage collection. I mean, because we're using these tools okay. in, in so, and everything, but only when we have memory leaks and we optimize other stuff and we seldom reach the point where we need to optimize the garbage collection. So my favorite client, um, which I won't mention for whatever non-disclosure reasons, reasons um, they continuously tune their garbage collector. And so we've ba we basically uh, developed special things and adapted our tooling to help them in this particular process. Um, so the, and that's the best way to do it. They were just continuously tuning the garbage collector as one step in the regime. Now they have like about 300 JVMs in their cluster. So you might think like, you know, holy crap, that could take a long time. And that's why the tooling is very important. And that's why we're able to just like completely batch process the whole tuning process um, in, um, in these environments. Most of the time, I get called when things are really, really, really messed up and they're deployed and people have been suffering for a while and they've complained, the complaints have been at a level high enough that, um, that uh, you know, they finally have to have someone come in to try to uh, calm things down, right? Um, it, and there's a lot of clients where we get somewhere in between. When they've deployed, they'll say, okay, let's have someone in that will uh, tune the collector. I, I would say that unless you're doing this on a very frequent basis, it's very, very unlikely that a company is going to have the in-house expertise to tune a collector properly. Uh, one of my clients, we actually train their in-house people, so they're very good at it now. It's, I would dare say they're better than me, which is not that high a bar, but... Um, but anyways, uh, the, the, the point is, is that we, we still work with them. We, we have a special Slack channel with them. They can contact us anytime. They send us data. We look at it. We talk. Um, they've learned uh, over, over a period of time the interactions have just gone down because they're just really good at tuning things now. It's only when they get into special circumstances um, or I need experiments run or something like that that we'll have a conversation. You know, but they're large cluster 1500 JVMs, they have a team dedicated to this, right? So for more, most companies, if it's just an occasional job, it's probably much easier and actually cheaper just to have someone come in. Um, like I did this for another company uh, in the States just recently. I mean, in one tuning, we took their SLA violations from 6% to 1%, right? Just with a simple GC tuning. So it can make a difference. Um, would they have been able to do it? No. Um, probably not. They just didn't have the in-house expertise. Even, even I can mention this name is Atlassian. We've tuned Atlassian clusters, and we were constantly at, at odds with Atlassian uh, customer support because they would say, "Oh, you can't tune the JVM that way." And the way we tune is data-driven. The way most support operations work, even Oracle, they have a template. So first-line support is tell them to do this, this, that. 
So it's not, not a data-driven thing, right? So since we're completely data-driven, we'll look at it and say, okay, you need to do this. And when we're at odds, um, then we have a problem because we have the product owner giving different advice than us. And now we have, you know, like we actually spend more time in meetings and discussing and explaining than we actually do tuning. And, and sometimes the ratio is as high as like, I get like four or five hours of billable in meetings for like, you know, 30 minutes of work. Which is cool, I don't mind, you know. <laughs> and my bill rate, I can take more of that, that's cool. Any more questions before we move on? Sorry, that was a long answer, but maybe scared anyone. Uh, any, uh, we have another question back up there, yeah. Do you know some good online resources to look, to read more about it? So it looks like it's a lot of work to Learn it, so oh, learn more. To get into it? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so for the garbage collection, I, there's all kinds of stuff all over the web, and the problem is um, when you vet it, some of it is just really bad. Um, there are some good stuff. Nitsen uh, Walker um, has some good stuff. Monica. Beckwith has some really good stuff on the web. Her stuff is dated, though. She hasn't updated it recently. Uh, but she was like uh, the performance engineer uh, for the G1 when she was working at Oracle. Um, other than that, uh, see, Ben Evans and James um, uh, Gowan got, just wrote a book. Um, and I helped collaborate with him on the GC tuning stuff. So he, the, that's uh, O'Reilly. Java Performance, I think, is the name of it. I'm not sure. Um, so th th these are some of the references. Uh, if you get into Friends of J Clarity, then uh, there is a number of, uh, well, Alexei Shipilev is, is on the list, and he's writing the, uh, the Epsilon garbage collector right now, which is basically, well, which isn't a garbage collector. <laughs> so he's, he's writing a way to get the garbage, take the garbage collector completely out of the JVM, so it's a JVM with no GC. Um, so, um, so our friends at J Clarity List would actually be helpful in that case. So you have access to uh, quite a few people who uh, can point you to more resources than I can come up with on the top of my head right here. Right here. Okay. Um, yeah, just subscribe and ask the question, and then you can unsubscribe if you don't want any more noise in your inbox. So perfectly okay. And last question, anyone? Um, no, everyone's just politely sitting there, so they they'll come find you afterwards. They haven't had yeah. enough coffee yet. Right. Thank okay. you for. Thank you, everyone. Bye. <laughs>